Nebraska corn growers experienced some ear formation issues during the 2016 season that were so unusual their cause hasn't yet been determined. Farmers noted short husks, dumbbell-shaped ears, and multiple ears per node. Justin McMicken is part of a Nebraska extension team trying to find the reason or reasons behind those issues. As Justin notes, Nebraska extension educator Jenny Reese first noticed the problems in her area of South Central Nebraska. Those were eventually confirmed in other areas of the state and Midwest as well. Justin joined us recently to describe what the ear formation issues look like and explain how the team is trying to find their causes. Yeah, so we initially got some reports in, in early August from Jenny Reese, and, and Jenny alerted us to some unusual ear development issues that were occurring, and, and so we went out and toured the fields and found some stuff that uh, Roger Elmore, who's been an agronomist here for uh, quite a few years, hasn't seen. Uh, and so initially we started looking through these and we tied them back to several different stages of development as far as our hypothesis on, on when stress might have occurred. Uh, and initially we thought this was really confined to Nebraska. So we were uh, fairly confident that some extreme weather events and a wind event specifically on July 7th may have been the cause of this. Uh, but then talking with other states later we found out that it was actually occurring in those states as well from some very credible resources. Um, and so that, that really kind of debunked our our wind event, we're not letting go of it as a possibility, but uh, it certainly leans the idea to, to some large uh, impact a across a wide region. And uh, those states were, you know, Iowa, Illinois, Kansas, down to Texas. Um, and so we, we kind of started reevaluating this. Uh, we quickly pulled together and did a large collection across Nebraska, mostly focusing on the, the southeast part of the state uh, and collected from 16 fields. And now we're really going through trying to sort out, uh, you know, by internodes and a lot of different characteristics on the plants themselves. Uh, as well as grower practices and planting dates and uh, things like that to try and figure out if there's some commonality in all these fields with the ear development issues. Let's talk about the three that you're noticing here. Short husks, tell me what the problem was. Yeah, so short husks, uh, as far as we know from, from corn development, that's usually occurring between V15 and V18. That's just prior to tasseling. That's when we expect those husks to be elongating. Uh, and, and they remain relatively short. Uh, and I should note that some hybrids do show shorter husks, not to the extreme that we saw in, in this case, uh, but it does help with dry down, so it can be a positive thing to have some short husks, but in this case we're talking a third of the entire length of the ear in some cases, and so it left that ear exposed uh, to a lot of different pathogens that could show up, and insect and bird feeding, and so as a result that exposed ear I think suffered a lot through the remainder of the, the season. Let's talk about the dumbbell-shaped ears. Yeah, the dumbbell-shaped ears are, are kind of a unique one. I, I think that it was particularly surprising to all of us, including uh, you know, the, the more experienced. Uh, but basically, we have an ear that had kernel formation towards the bottom, and then uh, at some point, that kernel formation stopped, and we have an inner cob, or inner cob that's quite small. Uh, and that really linked us back to that V12 to V15 stage when we'd expect uh, silks to be elongating. So no silks elongated in this case and left this blank space where there's no seed present. But then past that, we do get, uh, so we do get the presence of kernels again. So it's, it's kind of this unusual thing. We saw variations of that where there was no uh, seed formation at the bottom of the year as well as at the top. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, it presents kind of a conundrum because it suggests that this occurred at, at several different stages, whether or not those plants were at different stages of development or not. Uh, but that one's a little bit uh, unusual for us. Let's talk about the last one, multiple ears per node. Yeah, multiple ears per node I'm a little more familiar with. So uh, this one, uh, we, and in the case of all of these actually, uh, we, we currently hypothesize it's the loss of the primary ear. So we'd expect a primary ear to be present and it was lost sometime during the development stages. Uh, and these are all secondary ears, that's what we hypothesize. And our initial data that's coming out is suggesting that, but multi-ears really points to that. Uh, and basically we lose this primary ear even beginning as early as the V6 stage, so when these plants are quite small. Uh, and as a result we get hormones that push down the plant and cause all these ears to form. And so you can get a number of ears all the way down in fact to the soil level. Uh, and the reason I'm more familiar with this one is we did a study in 2015 where we removed the primary ear just after it formed. We could get this nice multi-ear development, not nice in the terms of what growers would want, but in the terms of identifying the causes for research, uh, it, it certainly points to primary ear loss. The fortunate thing with multi-ears is they really don't produce any seed because they're off sync from when we'd have pollen uh, being distributed throughout the field. So they, they're a heavy yield impact when they occur. Describe what this damage was in terms of severity and yield. Yeah, it varied a lot uh, and, and that'll help us identify what the, the potential causes might have been. But we saw fields with 70 to 80 percent of a range of the abnormal ears that I just described. Uh, and then in other cases down to 20 percent in a few fields that showed no symptoms at all. 
Um, so that'll really help us identify potential factors that might be linked to an individual field uh, to isolate this. So if a grower is watching this, they see something familiar that they thought they might have had in their field, what do they do? Yeah, you know, even though we're after harvest, we can't collect any more from those fields, we'd really like to know, especially if they took photos on this, because uh, it'll help us identify areas that were impacted. And because we're looking at things like temperature that we can get a large amount of data on, uh, a yes or no response from an individual field would help us determine which factors might be re responsible. Where do you guys go from here on this research? Yeah, this is, this is definitely a long-term project. So I think from here, we're going to hopefully identify a list of factors that might be responsible. And then we'll start isolating those and see if we can recreate the conditions that were spo responsible for this. Uh, so I see this as a, a multi-year process. Uh, we're hoping to give growers an indication of, of the cause and potential causes or a list. Because, uh, you know, that's essentially will help them with a bit of risk management in the future. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, things like this, when there's so many different uh, things that are showing up in the field, it will take us a while to sort it out. Nebraska Extension personnel will further discuss this issue at the Crop Production Clinics coming up next week in several locations across the state. You can find more information about those as well as contact information for Justin through links on the Market Journal website.